I love to sketch um, a lot of my research mm. ideas, uh, just like kind of take like a, a pen and like a, a, a journal and just go ahead and sketch. Um, and that could be usually for me, I'm, I'm a little more of like a, a, a logical kind of person. It's usually like um, they're usually diagrams or uh, flow charts. Kind of, sounds kind of boring, but it's definitely for me, it's like it really gets me to like think differently. Um, I know a lot of others, you know, they uh, enjoy just like generally drawing and that, that's great for them. Um, and then, of course, uh, one of my favorite things to do is listen to music. Um, I'm mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, uh, audiophiles that you'll ever meet. Learning to Swim is about learning from others. Be the author of your own story, not a character in somebody else's story. Get inspired by others to take action. Learn how to set goals to exceed your own expectations. So often the answer that you are looking for is right in front of you. On Learning to Swim, we highlight those answers through storytelling. Oh, well, I want to say welcome to my Learning to Swim guest today, who is Chinmai Super. And he is a, and I, we've already talked about the fact that I um, sometimes mispronounce things. So feel free to correct me at any time. No yeah. um, but I, you are a recent graduate of UC Santa Barbara, and you uh, got a bachelor's of science in biopsychology, and you are currently um, getting your PhD in clinical exactly. psychology. Yep. So um, in lots of school and, and then in addition to that, you're also the director of research uh, yes. at Yoga Parati. Yes, exactly they, right. Okay. Yoga Parati. Parati. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, but I just, I, first and foremost, I want to say welcome and, and thank you for spending this time with us today. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, sorry for, I know we rescheduled a couple of times because things got busy, but thank you for, uh, for keeping up with me. But um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, Absolutely. Well, we had connected and had talked several months ago. And one of the reasons why I wanted to grab you as a Learning to Swim guest is because Learning to Swim is a very um, casual interview series where we're exploring our own journey, um, whether it be professionally or personally and or how those are intertwined and, and really highlighting how there is no one path um, to, to, and there is no one Precisely. way of getting it right. So to that end, um, I like to always jump in with a, a super easy question, which is um, what is your definition of failure? Um, personally, I would say just unhappiness and not even unhappiness, discontent. That is my definition of failure. And obviously, you know, I could go deep into that, what I mean by discontent, but uh, for the most part, just generally being at a point of um, being comfortable with yourself, being comfortable with your mind, and um, just being generally happy. Mm. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean. And so then what do you what is your definition? And maybe you'd be willing to share a story. Um, from your own life around what does resilience look like or what is your definition of resilience? Yeah, um, definitely. I So for me, resilience is just a matter of, uh, there are so many synonyms uh, for it, but I would say um, determination, perseverance together um, really are what makes uh, uh, resilience, um, well, willpower is a part of that but of course uh for that uh i think it, it really takes a lot of effort um it takes a lot of hard work to be uh resilient um and most importantly i think um just you have to be willing to uh be accepting of failure so rejection and failure are going to be coming no matter what they, they there's like I, I like to say like 95 percent of the things you you, you're trying for, you're going for either personally or in your career, you're probably going to fail or get rejected. And that's totally okay because it makes the 5% that much better and that's normal. <laughs> yes, yes. And so I always think of one, of one of the components that I think of when I'm considering 
how I want to be in the world and how I want to engage with others and also how to keep myself um, from, you know, being stagnant or, mm. or closed off is, is remaining curious and, and having a, a curiosity um, exactly with it, with, you know, outlook with the world. And so what do you kind of, how do you foster curiosity within yourself? So personally, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm currently, so as you previously mentioned, I'm doing my PhD in clinical psychology uh, with that kind of inherently involves a lot of reading, uh, not just for school, but even just to uh, enrich my own uh, worldview, get a better understanding of how to put, um, how to even conduct like research, understand and notice pheno uh, phenomenology um, and things like that. Uh, just generally, I've had to, I, I, I spend a lot of time reading and that uh, almost always inspires a good amount of creativity for me. Um, I also like to, um, I, I'm just a researcher by heart and profession, including a, a therapist, but um, I love to sketch um, a lot of my research mm -hmm. ideas, uh, just like kind of take like a, a pen and like a, a, a journal and just go ahead and sketch. Um, and that could be usually for me, I'm, I'm a little more of like a, a, a logical kind of person. It's usually like um, they're usually diagrams or uh, flow charts kind of, sounds kind of boring, but it's definitely for me, it's like, it really gets me to like think differently. Um, I know a lot of others, you know, they uh, enjoy just like generally drawing and that that's great for them. Um, and then of course, uh, one of my favorite things to do is listen to music. Um, I'm mm -hmm. one of the biggest uh, uh, audiophiles that you'll ever meet. Um, yeah, I actually just, as of yesterday, bought another speaker. I have a problem. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I love, uh, I love listening to music, all types of music, especially, uh, hip hop. Um, and, uh, that's probably my f favorite genre. I've been listening to music since I was like three or four. Um, and I also play some instruments and sing. So, um, for me, I, uh, I love playing, playing music, um, and then finally, just always learning. That's really what keeps me interested, or interested and kind of engaged. So uh, I like learning new languages, refreshing on languages that I already know. Um, I know a couple, so um, it's uh, it's it's nice to keep learning. Right. So that's what I, that's what I would say. It's the best way for me to be creative. <laughs> So how do you, I, I've got so many questions to ask about this, um, but I just want to start with, you mentioned that you, you speak other languages. And so you also speak, um, tell us which languages you speak. So I speak um, my mother tongue. I actually didn't learn English until I was about four. I have a funny story about that, but um, my mother tongue is Kannada. So I know uh, it's a South Indian language um, okay. from uh, Karnataka, the state of Karnataka and Bangalore is located there. Um, but uh, Canada is my mother tongue, so I know that fluently, um, uh, conversationally fluently. And then I've learned Sanskrit for about 10 or 12 years of my life. So I can read and write um, the Devanagari script, which is the same script that's used for Hindi as well, mm -hmm. um, which is another Indian language. Um, so that I can read and write Hindi as well, uh, but I can only understand that, not speak it. Um, I can understand it thoroughly, though. And then uh, finally, Spanish, I'm proficient and completely so. And so I have kind of a very um, anecdotal and it's an extremely small sample size, but um, kind of theory about the relationship in terms of um, kind of proficiency with foreign languages and music. Um, do you see those as? Yeah. Kind of yeah, so um, I mean, I've actually looked into some literature about this as well. I, like, like I said, I enjoy just uh, you know spending some time on Google Scholar, but uh, there is definitely a sort of um, like a sort of relationship between starting at a young, starting either languages or music at a young age, and having the ability to both pick up languages and pick up music, um, like I, I either or. Um, for starting for, uh, like for the rest of your life so for me I'm thankful since uh, that I I spoke Canada only for the first four years of my life before I went to preschool um, because now it's easier for me to learn any language and pronounce almost any language um, but yeah the funny thing was uh, my when I was in preschool 
uh, the first week I was there, they the teacher thought that I didn't know that that I had like some sort of learning disability, and um, because I just wasn't speaking English. But um, so they told my dad that, and my dad was like, "Oh, th that's so weird. Oh, we don't think so. He's a, probably he started speaking when he was in six months old." Um, oh so I was like, I was speaking very young. Yeah. Um, and he was like, uh, he said, "Well, just why don't you give him another week, and then you'll see." And then uh, another week later, I was apparently the most talkative kid in class. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it's just a matter of like, I, I'm grateful for whatever genetics that is, uh, for whatever my parents helped me in terms of raising me to speak like multiple languages, teaching, going out of their way to teach me. Um, my mom went out of her way a lot to teach me Sanskrit, which mm. was really beneficial. It's a very logical and mathematical language, although it's a, um, it's starting to become a dead language although it's it's being revived now so uh yeah it's uh, definitely a lot of um it's very interesting to be learning languages well and that's a, that was going to be um another question i had is because i was going to ask you about sanskrit i had and my question and i i honestly i feel a little embarrassed to ask this but is my perception of of Sanskrit is is that it isn't necessarily a living language and so can you describe what I I mean and I guess I my familiarity with Sanskrit is through mantras and and mm, yeah and meditate you know a meditative practice yeah I'd love to explain that so um there are actually two types of Sanskrit nowadays like in, in this uh decade um or in the century, what I would say is one is um, the spoken language Sanskrit, which a lot of uh, like ling linguistic, like linguists and activists have been making an effort since uh, like pre-colonial and post-colonial times in India to kind of bring back um, like, or there are a couple of organizations that uh, work to uh, teach uh, students, teach people the spoken language. And that happened, that's been picking up, ramping up exponentially since, um, since I was born, at least. I know it was going on before that too, but now it's, uh, you can go online and find a course to learn some, like spoken Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. So that is one side. And then there's the chanting that you just mentioned. So that's called Vedic. That's more of like, um, uh, that's uh, scriptural Sanskrit. So okay. the Vedas, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, all of these are like uh, ancient texts. Um, they're all in uh, written Sanskrit and in, in uh, scriptural Sanskrit. So a lot of those are, it's the same language, technically, it's just a lot harder to understand. It's like going from reading like, you know, Roald Dahl to like, going ahead and reading like Aldous Huxley or something right it's like right. You're, you're gonna there's gonna be a huge difference but um or even for that matter like reading the bible um but uh yeah so the 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 second portion which is the just learning um if you want to learn this the the Sanskrit for the actual uh for the scriptures then there's a gurukulam system and a lot of uh places where uh you would end up uh essentially submitting your like li like your childhood and your um like your learning years to going to a uh, uh like an ashram like a mm -hmm. where um like a learned uh man like a sage or a guru will be uh will he will have he or she they will be passing on their generational knowledge uh for years that's just what their family line does so they continue they host these like quote schools um, where they teach uh, the Vedas and um, these uh, scriptural texts. So and part of that is they have to learn Sanskrit. Okay. Well, so it's not you. entirely dead yet. Okay. Uh, or actually, I shouldn't say yet. It's not, it was at one point like kind of um, like d dying, but now it's like even spoken, it's like completely back. But no one actively speaks it um, in cities like conversationally. It's more of like select groups of people just like, who want to keep it alive so we're okay. hoping to bring that make that more popular hindi is the um is, is the uh national language of india um right. although that's also starting to change to english now but whatever <laughs> it is what it is it's colonialism <laughs> yeah well i and then um part of what you mentioned was just your love of reading and and so i was reading i was reading an article recently that was talking about because I tend to read kind of both fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, and I really, sometimes I, I feel a little guilty about reading fiction. And then of course I found I an article. Well, and that's what I was going to ask you because I found this article that it, I think it was, you know, Harvard Business Review that said, you know, reading fiction is good for you. And, and it, it actually, it um, is. there's, there's a place for it. So, so you read fiction too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's like, you know, you watch a TV show and it's kind of it's interesting right like if you watch like obviously not a doc if you're not watching a documentary it's like going to be made up that's the same right. thing in my mind with a fiction book it's like a story that you're creating in your own head it's like you have the imagination already you're just getting the input of the storyline and it's like it's it's wonderful i mean uh my favorite form of entertainment is fiction and sci-fi mm. yeah so do you have a recommendation that you're either reading now or what well, I'll I'll always look, this one will always be my favorite, but like I'm not it's just a very cliched opinion. But Harry Potter, I read that once a year, the whole the whole series. Um, like something changes every year um, when I read it. <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's like you know I grew up with that book, so uh, with that series, and mm -hmm. same with my brother. That was one of the biggest things we bonded on over. So uh, we both read it every year um, once. Well, and it is pretty, I have to say, I, I read uh, not all of the books to my kids, but I, I mm. definitely read, I think, the first one or two, definitely the first one and maybe part of the second one. But Got you. those are just, um, they are just magical and, and really um, transport you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 that's a great recommendation. Also love the dystopian type of books. So those are, those are always... Um, pretty solid so which ones do you like of that um uh well of course there's like 1984 there's animal farm um yeah i would say george orwell is like probably that's what like right off the top of my head but yeah i don't want to spend too much time i'm sure we have a lot that we want oh to discuss, yeah well but, it's always uh, fun to talk about books i could you know, yeah, I could talk I could, about books forever. So I could spend my life reading. It's yeah. um, I just love it. <laughs> but I also love music. So just tell me what is what you're listening to right now that is kind of one of your Ooh, favorites. Like right, literally right now next yes. to me that is like I paused to pick up this to join this call was um, Travis Scott as a mm -hmm. he's a hip hop artist. Yeah. Um, I enjoy various different, like, I mean, within hip hop is my favorite genre. I listen to every, basically everything, every genre, but within hip hop, there are also a lot of uh, sub genres. I really appreciate um, some of the more conscious uh, rap as well as um, trap. Trap is basically uh, more hi hats, higher hi hats, um, more frequency of hi hats and higher uh, frequency of bass. Um, more bass essentially so so is trap uh, more kind of atlanta based or is trap, that... like it uh I, I, this is a arguable um statement but it like technically is like around in uh, atlanta started up in atlanta in that area um andre 3000 uh like big boy so this is uh outcast uh right. these art artists kind of like started the scene in the area um of course I, I mean, they're, they're everywhere, but a lot of the recent, the recently in the last, like, I'd say 10, 15 years, there's been a huge uh, movement and evolution of trap music in, uh, in Atlanta, where um, we're seeing uh, a lot of new producers making just unbelievable sounds. Um, so it's like a hub of music down there, but yeah. Um, essentially, yeah, they, they just characterize trap with uh, three things, uh, like the drum drums, which are supposed to be frequent um, uh, hi-hats and uh, like in triplets, uh, the, mm -hmm. the kick drum and bass, and then also um, triplet flows. So the flow in rapping is actually slightly different. Um, so yeah, that is like, I mean, of course there's many more genres, but um, I also enjoy listening to artists like um, Kendrick Lamar, J-Rock, um, uh, J. Cole, uh, um, of course, like Beyonce, um, a lot of underground artists, if I mention yeah I, I mean I could again same with same as book I could go on for <laughs> we could go like down hours. a rabbit hole um I could go on for hours but I just you know thought I'd uh, mention a couple of a uh, couple of artists at the least <laughs> oh yeah well I I definitely I think that um you know one of the things that I enjoy most about rap and I I am thinking specifically right now of Kendrick Lamar is I I just I love it's such um incredible poetry exactly 
His, uh, and... his album won a Pulitzer, actually. Oh, yeah, that's right. I think I, yeah. I did read that and I forgot it, but it's, it is, it's, it's so, and then also just the, the storytelling quality. Exactly. Um, exactly. I think it's so powful. And I, I so it's, um, and I feel it, like we learn so much from exactly. stories, right? It kind of ties into my whole uh, mission with, uh, with my clinical psychology, therapy, social work, everything that I intend to do and I am doing. Um, I mean, I appreciate hip hop the most. The reason why I like I like it the most is because you're getting these perspectives from people that you wouldn't necessarily. I'm privil- I'm I, I acknowledge that I'm privileged, and I'm you know I'm living in an area that is well now is not that safe, but it, like I have grown up in an area that's relatively um, like safe and uh, not a lot of not a lot going on, but. Um, in terms of income disparity, in terms of socioeconomic disparities, um, in terms of just generally um, the the government, like the uh, systemic oppression, the systemic racism that kind of happens. Uh, there are a lot of stories that we're not necessarily hearing that we should. It's our it's our obligation, it's our responsibility to know these things um, as fellow human beings. But um, I, I really appreciate hip hop because there's this sense of a um, like a raw direct sort of channel of communication um, between these artists that I that are just geniuses, some of the smartest people I've met, some of the most analytical and passionate people I've met or that I've ever heard. I wish I met them, um, but one day, most, yeah, one day <laughs> that I've heard. So um, that's why I really appreciate listening to hip hop. It's just kind of it, it constantly enhances my um my my work my uh my vision my goals uh everything yeah yeah i would i would agree so if going back to books if we think of you you mentioned raw doll for instance so if you think about a book or a story from childhood that either you read or that was read to you or told to you um is there one that that you can think of that has kind of still significance for you today? Yes. Um, I would say like just from Roald Dahl, James and the Giant Peach. I think that's one, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that that uh, definitely, um, there's another one even more specific that I really, um, I, I haven't read children. I, children books has been a while. I used to um, actually also read books in um, in Sanskrit, read uh, like comics. Uh, uh-huh. these, um, we used to get these like comics in English and Sanskrit from India. So that's what I, I'd read a lot of that when I was younger and until I started reading like nonfiction and like, you know, older books. But yeah, I, I think I would say probably in my opinion, James and the Giant Peach would be the best i'm looking up the other one but yeah we can continue i'll tell you as soon as i find it <laughs> oh yeah well just tell me so what i mean i know how much i love raw doll and i i love um and james and the giant peach is such a, a really incredible of story. course and Tr- charlie and the chocolate factory yes. oh the the uh oh yeah charlie and the great um the great glass elevator the there's there's one that was the elevator right right yeah, yeah. that one that one yeah yeah that one was my favorite, hands down. Okay, so what was your favorite about that? I liked the, I liked the way the book was written. Um, I, I was a kid, it felt like I was being transported like with the, with the character. Um, and I mean, it's, a, it's very imaginative. So I definitely felt like I was, I, was, I was stimulated by that. It felt comforting to read, but I mean, Honestly, again, uh, I, I have to say, like that, I, I the first Harry Potter book, I keep going. Uh, even as like when I first could start reading, like three or four, like four or five, that's when I started when I picked up that book. So um, that is like I would remember from the beginning, like of my childhood. I so clearly remember where I was sitting, what I was doing, anytime I was reading that book. So, what do you think in in terms of you know whether it's your your undergrad degree of biopsychology or your your current um, PhD studies or even your your research that you're doing is I find it kind of fascinating how like terrifying so many children's books are 
Oh, yes. And yes. like, and what is like, and, and I remember as a kid loving that, um, and especially as a book, I'm not necessarily loving it. Um, in terms of scary movies, like mm. not the visual thing, but yeah, I, book, I was able to watch scary movies until no. I was like 16. So, well, I know my mom didn't want me to watch scary yeah. movies till I was like 25, but um, <laughs> I kind of snuck out once in a while. Um, and, but, but I mean, what is it about, what is, is there something in your, that you've come across in your research or your studies or, or your reading that, that talks about kind of those is really scary story or even if you think of just the the casual um you know disney film or the the fairy tales that yeah. most kids in in the united states digest have so this, I can, this very terrifying element i can definitely tell you my like i haven't done research into it like looked up like articles or read textbooks yeah. but from my experience and my knowledge of um, psychology, I can, and clinical psychology, developmental psychology, I can probably give you an answer. So I think it's actually not bad at all. Um, there's a reason why a lot of these are G, uh, rated G or PG, and that mm -hmm. means children can watch them. I mean, the uh, rating system, I forgot exactly what the, the board is called, but they yeah, actually G, are, G is general audience. Yeah, which, yeah, but I mean, I mean it, the, the, the oh, yeah, institution I, in charge of like putting, right, like, rating those but um i i'm sure they wouldn't let like children watch something unless they've done extensive research into seeing what kind of content like they have guidelines that are okay for um like children or um, adolescents to watch um now that being said i also grew up in that generation where i was watching i watched a show called ed ed and eddie which in um it was in my uh in on cnn or on cartoon network when i was like you know, growing up like four to seven years old, four to eight years old. Um, and the premise of the show was essentially a bunch of kids that were in purgatory, literally in purgatory. It was like, it's a, it's a, it's, it so was they're all, dead. Yeah. They're they're dead kids. We don't know. Technically they're dead. Yeah. Okay. But they're yeah. in purgatory. Uh, they're, um, it's, it's like completely no adults there. Uh, it's all animated. It's like completely animated. It's like cartoon. So, yeah. um, and uh, they would be doing now I went back and looked uh, watched a couple of episodes of the show like 10 years later and I was like one that it, that was a lot of very suggestive stuff in there that I just completely would have missed as a kid and two um, there are a lot of re really dark themes and really dark dark things in there but I find myself even today referring to that and talking about like 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 you know the certain themes that I found compelling and relevant in my in my day-to-day -day today Right. So mm -hmm. um, I found personally that I did watch things like horror movies growing up sometimes. Like I, I even if I watched a trailer for a horror movie, I wouldn't be able to sleep for like three nights. Right. Yeah. Um, but or sometimes once I watched it for The Exorcist, I watched a trailer for the remake <laughs> and I couldn't sleep for two months for two weeks. So oh my gosh. I couldn't en enter a door without like looking up into the corner. <laughs> but uh, like what I think is um, you know, some, some kids, they kind of grow out of it. Some kids, they, um, and for me, I personally, I grew out of it completely. I can watch just about anything and it doesn't affect me later on. Um, also obviously, you know, get, getting busy and all that stuff kind of makes a difference because you kind of just watch something and then you move on. Yeah. But, um, for kids, I think it's actually good to have something like, um, a little more realistic, a little more, not just like, you know, all just fairy tales and, um, all smiles because, uh, to be fair, you know, it's good to start seeing at a younger age when you have parental support, you have family around you, um, what like, you know, the real world is like. So um, I think it's good that, you know, I don't think kids should just ultimately, I don't think kids should be sheltered too much. Um, I, I, I grew up not being sheltered. Um, I, I can tell now a huge part of it is um, a part of the mental health rates uh, in adolescence increasing, like it's a shot up. It's uh, actually mm -hmm. a, a problem. Um, it has to do. It has to do with kids not going out outside anymore, um, spending most of their time on social media, um, et cetera. So I mean, honestly, just even getting back to the era of just like sitting down in front of TV if your parents are, are at work for like three hours and watching something, even that's better than just like going onto social media or whatever. But um, yeah, I think it's important that kids do get exposure, start, start getting exposure to that kind of stuff. And it can be harmful. Um, down the line, you know, if it does stick with you, you end up traumatized from something. Uh, you, there's always therapy. 
So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, yeah, I do think it's really fascinating um, when you you think of kind of the the content for kids and 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 I agree with you. I think it is healthy, and I think that there is kind of when you're younger, you know, to to be reading those or watching some of those um, exactly. cartoons or movies that are a little bit have some kind of darker themes and and just um, kind of with the safety net, hopefully yeah. of your family um, exactly and i mean parental con controls on tv like nothing over g um yeah. until parents are home all that like i mean i have little cousins and um my uncles do that now back when i was a kid my parents never bothered or did any of that but now yeah. my uncles uh and they have like t i know tvs and whatnot have time settings where you can only watch right, right. For, like <laughs> an hour or two so i get i know you can do a, a lot of that so maybe that's an option for any uh, listeners that might not have thought of it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, let's pivot a little bit and um, talk about if to date, I realize you're a young man with a, a long career ahead of you, but if there was one word that you could use to describe your professional life to date, what would that be? Um, I would say outreach and research like i'm a researcher like just so my career now is research is, is that what you're asking yeah well yeah, i mean so, just in and also i mean i think that's an those are an interesting couple of words outreach and research um because in some ways there's a um i don't know research in in a certain context i think of as being a rather solo and so that, that goes into my uh the my job like what why i uh, so um so obviously research for my phd learning and research and, uh, right. and for my work um and then for work also i uh travel um well one uh the my work entails uh i i have a couple of people that work with like under like for me essentially some volunteers um so, so my work actually entails finding research grants, putting together general research proposals and projects, okay. um, attending conferences and presenting at conferences. Um, and then that, I guess that would be outreach. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, um, another part of my work involved and then doing research project, connecting with universities, et cetera. And then another par part of my uh, work entails um, me traveling to other countries recently because of COVID, I haven't gone to do it, but I traveled to Trinidad and Tobago mm. and trained a group of um, 10 yoga instructors um, as a, a group of 10 uh, people who were mm -hmm. wanted to be certified yoga instructors um, right before COVID happened. So oh, um, I was there for a month, actually. So uh, we have a couple other trips coming up to um, like to keep training so the way our training model is is um we uh we're a, a yoga alliance certified school so okay. uh, we can train people to become um uh, uh registered yoga teachers um and they can and they would register once they get our certificate they can register with yoga alliance and get mm -hmm. their uh, teaching certification so all the studios and sh uh and stuff that you would see here in the um in like in any city or in um in like gyms usually the teacher is a uh, ryt certified instructor so um there i have had i've had 12 1200 hours experience teaching wow. so um well now it should be somewhere like 1500 but so as a result i have an uh i i'm certified i have an eryt uh, 200, meaning I'm certified to teach people how to become yoga instructors. Like teach, I am certified to teach that course. Wow. Okay. So um, what we do is we teach uh, online about uh, all of, there's like a certain number of uh, contact, like in-person hours we have to do, which is like um, something like 30 hours. So mm -hmm. we travel to another country and do like an in-person one week long workshop. And then um, the rest, we just do online every weekend and uh, uh, some self-study as well. So um, that's how we train our yoga teachers and our yoga therapists. Um, so we have students in um, all over the country. We have students in India. We have students in, um, in the Caribbeans. 
and we're just picking up more and more students um, every, uh, we run them every two months. So mm -hmm. uh, we're just, every two months we're picking up more and more. In fact, right before I was uh, hopping on here, I was just setting up uh, the like uh, Google ads to run some ads for our, since it's working well, for some reason yeah. our, therapy, our training services. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely my job is a, a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, hopefully that was able to answer your question. Well, and so what is, talk to me a little bit. I, I just actually noticed that a local yoga studio here in Southern California is offering mm. yoga therapy, which um, was not something I, I hadn't necessarily, I, I think of, of yoga as being yeah. therapeutic in a way, but a, specifically yoga therapy. Can you talk to me about what the Thank difference is? Yeah. That is a wonderful, wonderful question. And I would love to explain and get the platform to explain that. Um, so the way I like to think of yoga is uh, the Western world sees yoga as just a, another form of exercise, like Pilates, um, like uh, Zumba, whatever that might be, just, you know, some increased flexibility, less cardio. Right. Uh, the Eastern world, for the most part, sees yoga as um, maintaining positive health, both physically and mentally. So um, yoga it doesn't just involve physical postures and all of that, but it also involves a lot of meditation, breathing. It's actually the physical postures are uh, they add up to your um, to to there's there's supposed to be preparatory practices for you to get to a state of like your mind being calm and stable before you start your um, your practices, your uh, meditation practices. Mm, okay. So that's what the, that's the purpose of yoga, the original purpose. Now, what? Um, what we've done, what uh, yoga uh, practitioners and uh, scholars have done since um, like early, for as long as we can remember, since BC era, um, uh, but the Patanjali uh, is the, one of the first sages to document this. His name is uh, Patanjali. Patanjali, Sage Patanjali, he wrote a, um, a book of around uh, 8,000 sutras. Sutras are like little phrases. Mm -hmm. um, and each one explains a different like uh, purpose of uh, like how to how to practice yoga, why to practice yoga, what yoga is, um, like what is the benefits, what can it be used for, um, how do you control the mind, all these things. Um, and like I was mentioning previously, um, it's one of those uh, scriptural texts. So uh, a lot of people actually have a book that that is. Um, uh, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is translated, so it's uh, usually someone that is a Sanskrit scholar uh, will go ahead, and there there are a lot of translations, but we'll go ahead and like translate the each each sutra and mm -hmm. then write out the um, like their interpretation of it. So same thing with the Bhagavad Gita. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of sc scholars do that as well. So um, that is how it originally kind of started. Um, now that's how the science was kind of started to get aggregated that was before mm -hmm. uh, the scientific revolution in the 1600s um post scientific revolution uh the eastern world mostly that was uh, that was happening in the western world the eastern world was kind of hugely disregarded um not taken seriously but uh they were always consistently doing their own research and um, especially, at least I know about India well, so I'll talk about that. India has had uh, universities for, uh, again, BC era as well, um, but uh, they started forming like the modern day universities around the 1800s um, and started conforming to kind of that British uh, like schooling system, et cetera, because, you know, colonialism. Um, and then, so um, what happened is around 19, uh, mid 1900s, uh, one of our, our parent organization, uh, Svyasa University, they're located in Bangalore. Um, mm -hmm. They are a, a university, so they're a rehab facility in person, like like a hospital, as mm -hmm. well as a um, like a, uh, a yoga, Ayurveda, so just uh, allopathic medicine, Ayurvedic mm -hmm. medicine, uh, naturopathic medicine, um, and uh, yogic uh, yoga therapy. Uh, so it's like a full thorough, like uh, healing, like full like healing and rehabilitation uh, hospital uh, in like the outskirts in the remote uh, outskirts of Bangalore. It's this huge facility. Uh, there they also have been doing research in yoga and they train uh, uh, postgraduate students as well as uh, doctoral, master's and doctoral students. 
Um, so that's our parent organization. We started in 2002 in, in the United States as a student organization, um, or at least like the child organization from okay. that organization. So um, they have been conducting research in the way that the Western world has been conducting psychological research and mm. um, like life sciences research for the last, um, like, I'd say 60 years, 50, 50 years or so. Um, so you'd see the some of the first seminal works uh, in, in yoga and the impact effects of yoga. I haven't even gone to yoga therapy yet, but you see that in around the 70s and 80s, uh, especially Dr. Uh, H.R. Nagaratna and her work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are uh, researchers in the West um, at Harvard, Stanford, um, um, Mayo Clinic, like it's various, like very popular uh, places um, yeah. that have started doing research in like the 80s and 90s. So now we see this whole worldwide, I've been to some international conferences now, but well, we're all throughout the world, people are taking up yoga and doing um, both subjective and like qualitative and quantitative research mm-hmm. on yoga, publishing books on yoga um, throughout the, uh, like more and more every day. And then yoga therapy, what they do is they take that whole, so there's the whole set of practices, the whole, all like the toolbox of techniques, let's put it mm-hmm. that way. Um, then what yoga therapy does is it will pick from that toolbox. It's like, imagine like a medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll pick the like medicines that like the, the techniques and the plan that you would need for as per your ailment. And this is all backed up. This is all backed in research and literature. So let's say Mm -hmm. you have back pain. Uh, let's Mm -hmm. just say, I mean, let's just say you suffer from chronic back pain. Um, there's plenty of research that shows, um, what type of yoga practices and what type of yoga regimens can help improve um, things like back pain um, and actually give you a benefit. So we have our yoga therapy services uh, wing as well. So we do uh, one-on-one sessions with clients where uh, our, our trained yoga therapists, not our teachers, but our therapists, right. they go through like, it's like yogic science. They go through the, like, essentially like uh, physiology training, anatomy training, uh, psychology training, um, they like everything. So it's like they they work alongside with doctors as well. Um, so uh, they, they actually teach, uh, they do one-on-one sessions with people. So that's what yoga therapy is. We have worked with um, almost every single ailment you could possibly think of um from like just like the general like chronic musculoskeletal pain Mm -hmm. to um like diabetes like endocrine disorders obesity um hypertension stress-related disorders every single type of mental health disorder autoimmune and cancer so uh als um uh, various different types of cancer to improve either help improve and come out of it or improve quality of life Um, so we have actually worked pretty much on everything. And I, I work mostly with, uh, the, um, more challenging, uh, mental health related cases. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's really informative and, and really inspiring to know that there are alternative ways of, of treating some of the more kind of common ailments that we sometimes just, um, you know, end up taking medications for or, or whatever. It's, um, I guess the thing that strikes me is that it's a very, um, for the, for the patient, so to speak, um, it's a, it's a very empowering, um, approach. Exactly. We've noticed a huge, huge benefit, especially when I was in Trinidad and Tobago, we did after the, that, training the teachers mm-hmm. we did the stop diabetes movement which we partner with another um nonprofit called seva international mm-hmm. um and they provide uh uh they send us over to these countries to train uh some some of their volunteers so after that we did this uh sdm program stop diabetes movement um where we we had two doctors with us that we trained so we actually took all of the like we did a full study pre and uh like we took like their blood sugar hba1c asked them to log their daily uh heart rate and everything and by the end of it we noticed a huge reduction in uh like huge improvements across the board statistically significant improvements and then additionally um in between in the first two days uh after the first two days one person actually a couple of people came up to us and asked if they could reduce their metformin dosage 
and mm. we were like no you can't because we need like one <laughs> like you need to talk to your doctor right two, right um like we need like consistent data and we don't want the metformin to get in the way but they were like we actually feel like we're taking too much metformin so what do we do so we had them talk, talk to the doctor our doctors that we had there so um yeah it's 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 really beneficial i was on the guardian in trinidad and tobago on live tv um and uh, I conducted a 10 minute yoga session wearing a suit on like behind like a <laughs> chair with like a mic on and everything. Yeah. And we got calls from all over the, like the, the, the little Island. Um, and uh, one, the best one was an 80 or a, I think a 72 year old woman called and said uh, she practiced with us for like watching TV with yeah. me for 10 minutes. And um uh, she this is the most relief she, she's felt in 40 years of having diabetes and that was 10 minutes yeah. of practice of just breathing and light stretching like what I'm doing right here on a chair and like yeah. slight movements like that's like basically it incredible yeah oh it's my gosh. quite it's quite incredible so we the the testimonies there the anecdotes are there the um like the research is definitely there that's like not even a concern but um there's definitely more and more money flowing in and I think people are starting to realize just that react reactionary approach to medicine isn't going to keep working it's definitely going to you know reduce lifespan it'll the side effects are going to be terrible the quality of life is going to go down so um to kind of just help with like as an adjunct treatment we always say an adjunct treatment yoga therapy yeah. is always really beneficial um, also just generally yoga practice, uh, in like daily yoga practice is great. You can check out our website, yogaparthi.org. We have a lot of options. We offer online classes on, uh, a daily schedule and, mm. uh, we, we offer like a monthly membership. You can just pay and sign up, join any of our classes. And we have teachers teaching every day. So, uh, and like, I think three times a day. So, um, yeah, definitely. If and anyone listening, well, I'll, I'll make sure and put that in the notes, um, yeah. for the episode. Well, I there's, yeah. And I'll make sure we've touched on a lot of things that I'm going to include in our notes. Um, a last couple of questions here. Absolutely. Um, so I, you know, one of the things that I am always thinking about in terms of my work with my coaching clients and my business owners in particular are, thinking about our blind spots and bright spots. And, and mm. so kind of do you, um, and then kind of coupled with that is, is the whole title of the Learning to Swim um, interview series, which is really refers to kind of those gifts that we have that we don't necessarily recognize. Yes. Um, so what would, but I think, Given your background and your field of study, I, I'm guessing you have a pretty good awareness of your yourself and your talents. So what is kind of your in plain sight talent? I mean, what's a what's something that most people who know you would recognize as they'd say, you know, Jinmai, he's, you know. I'd say magnetic and collaborative, like very, very easy to collaborate, uh, magnetic, collaborative and a leader. So uh, most people in my life, I think they look at me as like as the leader. I mean, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything. Oh, here, no. but Yeah. Um, yeah. But I would say like definitely magnetic, collaborative, passionate and uh, and the leader. And what is what's more of a hidden talent that someone might not see I'm on the surface great, i'm a great teacher okay yeah i would say i'm a great teacher so i mean ultimately uh, i've always, i've been teaching since i was 11 or 12 i taught sanskrit first and then i taught yoga for a while and then in college i taught um i taught for a little bit and then now i'm, I'm i might be working picking up a job as a ta soon but okay. um aside from that i've also taught yoga instructor courses um and then also just generally, you know, teaching friends how to drive, like simple things like that. And without them being scared, um, <laughs> like, you know, like just help being helpful with uh, when someone doesn't know how to do something instead of just doing it for them, even, unless they absolutely need it in the time being, um, teaching them how to do things and just teaching in general. Yeah. So what would be, um, what would be your tip to people who are in a position maybe in the workplace or, or perhaps there's folks who, who just want to, you know, help out amongst their peer group. Um, 
how, what's a, a tip for being a good teacher? Like what, what makes a good teacher? Patience. Number one thing is patience. So <laughs> I would say, you want to be a good teacher, you have to understand that, like, that students are going to take their time. Um, mm -hmm. It's better that it's better. Every student is different and they take their time. It's better if you are as patient as you can be. It's counterproductive to not be or your students aren't going to learn fast. But yeah, I would say patience is key. Mm. Well, thank you. That is a great note for us to wrap up on. And I so thank you for all of your insights and sharing about yourself today and, and your journey. And um, I know there's so much more to come for you. So it's, it's a really exciting time for you. Congratulations. It's my pleasure, Kristen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, very good. Well, thank you, everyone. And if you liked this, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, there will be more Learning to Swim coming your way. Thank you. Our goal is to inspire others and share stories to find meaning in your daily life. Let go of the traditional norms and be yourself at home, work, and beyond. The awareness of bright spots and blind spots is a performance enhancing tool that you can apply to your life and to your organization today.